And a lot of times it may not require a shouting and screaming, but I don't know about you, when I think about God, it makes me want to holler. <laughs> Hallelujah. It makes me want to say something. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Amen. So we're going to sing a few congregational songs and uh, prepare ourselves for some testimonials and someone to come up here and to share with us uh, what they've been through. A lot of you may not know me, but my name is Pastor Gary Lee and I hail from New York City. I've been here now for almost, almost 25, 30 years. And God has blessed me to come and relocate to this area after suffering a, a severe addiction amen and i wasn't one of those cats you see on the street running around with my jaws all tight and you know walking around aiming for money but i walked on I worked on wall street and i was a functioning addict amen wow. i would work every day but i'd go home broken dying on the inside wondering how in the world am i going to get up the next day and do this all over again amen until i came to the end of myself Amen, like that prodigal son. And I found myself eating the husk from the pig pen. And I looked up and said, God, if you will have me, I'll come. And he brought me down here to North Carolina. And ever since, God has, has elevated me in ways that I never could have imagined in my entire life. So I'm here to tell you that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask and or think. Yeah. Amen. Give me that. Give me. Let me share this because I got this young man here who's sitting right here. This man right here, his name is Darius Shackleford. I came here from New York City, and I had a suitcase and a twenty-dollar bill in my pocket. That's all I had. Oh. And I came here and uh, I went to my brother's house for a night, and it didn't work out. To make a long story short. And um, so I was thinking about going back home afterwards, and I ran into this brother, a friend of ours, and he told me about Darius. Darius came and got me and he took me to church that night. The next day I was trying to find a way to get another ticket to go back home. That man took me in his home, didn't know me from Adam, and allowed me to stay there for several months until I could get my feet on the ground. What does that mean? He had compassion on a stranger. But he also had to have what I call discernment because you can't let everybody in your house around your children. Come on somebody. So I'm not telling you give an open wallet to someone who comes because people have to have a desire for change. Somebody say change is possible. Change is possible. We have to have a desire for change. And if we don't see that, then it's hard for us to gravitate to help people. Amen. So you have to be prayerful about who you help, but be open to help. Amen. Amen. I want you all to join me in this song. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made I will rejoice I will rejoice
give the Lord a praise in this place. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you said.
praise him and worship the Lord. We love you, Lord. Lord. You changed my life, Lord. You turned me around. You saved yes, me. Yes. Yes. Save well, praise him. Praise him. Come on, open your mouth, please. Come on. You set me free. Hallelujah.
Ministries, raise your hand, wave your hand. Woo! Whole Heart Ministries is about seeking God with our all. It's about coming after God with everything that we have. We pray a lot. We fast a lot. We're in the streets a lot. Because the church can't stay indoors anymore, can it? No. Somebody talk to me. The church can't stay inside the walls anymore. we got to bring the gospel out. Our culture is in trouble. People are dying. So many people are demon possessed. So many people are addicted. We need freedom. And inside the church, inside those walls, that system, it's not working. Y'all, it's not working. So that's why we're out here on this lawn. That's why we're here right now. And I am privileged to have every one of you here from your different churches, from your different backgrounds, your different stories. And I'm extremely privileged to have my brother Harold Randolph yeah. here. Yeah. Harold and I met, uh, I think, at the beginning of 2020. Um, we were grieved when his mother passed away, and we had met her briefly, and we connected with him, and saw Harold and Apostle Lee at the, at the funeral, got to share with them um, in that moment, and then we got to know Harold a little bit more through that, got to visit Spirit and Truth Worship Center, shout out, raise your hand if you're in Spirit and Truth, Apostle Lee got to know him through Harold, and it's been a beautiful connection, and God's been working through us and through our relationship. Harold is a man who has grown up in his neighborhood. He ran these streets, <laughs> ran these streets with Shaq over here. They got stories about this place, right? And I do a lot of street ministry here, okay? I'm on the street all the time. Most of the people around here know me. I got this little megaphone, and I walk around and preach, right? I'm like, oh, man, there's that weird white pastor, right? <laughs> but I come out here and preach and share the gospel. I know a lot of these people by name. And I put this event on mainly for them. And... Um, a couple of them <laughs> have come, so praise God for that. And others have heard, even if they're not in the tent, right? right. They can hear. That's why we got this beautiful sound system. But um, I am so honored because Harold is a man who has grown here, right? Who was raised here, who went through the right. struggles right. here, who had the family problems, who endured the racism, who came up in that time, right? Yeah. And a lot of these men and women that I talk to have a lot of excuses, and they have a lot of reasons that they haven't become that they're not there. Yeah. there. But Harold, is a, he's an outlier, right? And there's many like him, actually. And we believe change is possible for yeah. anyone. Yeah. And so I am so thankful for his testimony and his unique voice and his authority over this community to speak in a way that I can't. I'm not from here. I haven't gone through all those struggles. I've got my own stories. But I want to w welcome Harold to the stage. Yeah. Harold, will you come up? This is what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to grab another microphone. Uh, one, two, check. One, two. This is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk through through Harold's story. We're just going to story tell. In the scripture, oftentimes it says remember. It uses that word remembrance, okay? Remember all the Lord has done. There's whole passages of scripture, like at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Y'all remember that passage? At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, actually much of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses just gets up and what does he do? He just retells Israel's story. He says, you were slaves in the land of Egypt. The Lord brought you forth. The Lord did this. The Lord did this. The Lord did this. Because through stories, we find strength. Through the God stories, we find strength. Through those testimonies, right? You might be going through something tonight, and Harold's going to speak to something that you've been going through. And when we see the examples of men and women that have walked before us, that have overcome through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the shed blood of Jesus, we gain energy, and we gain power, and we gain courage and we gain reasons to pray and maybe if it's not your story it's the story of someone you know isn't it it's Sharita's story Sharita shared last night about her story and all she came through God bless her and where she's headed but we're gonna let we're gonna let Harold begin to share and we're gonna share Harold's story kind of in three sections we're gonna do a little bit of an interview style might not be quite as energetic and popping as Apostle Lee's message last night but we're gonna talk okay and because we value the story and if it's a little bit more Relaxed and laid back. I know you're still going to give your full attention Amen. because this isn't just this isn't just a sermon. This is Harold's life. Right. Okay, this is this is real, and this is what God has brought Harold through. So let's just say a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our brother's story. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for dying on the cross at Calvary. Yes, Lord. I thank you for tearing the veil and sending your Spirit so that we all can walk in freedom. Not just from addictions, but from our sins. You broke the power of sin, and we can walk in freedom. So we thank you for the freedom. 
And we thank you for the manifest work of the gospel that you did in our brother's life. Bless him and be with us all as we receive tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Harold and I did this before one time. Uh, there's a video of Harold's testimony up on YouTube, but we're going to share most of that tonight. Uh, you can also go find that at Whole Heart Movement. If you go on YouTube and look up Whole Heart Movement, Harold Randolph, you'll find his uh, another video of his story. Because if it encourages you tonight, maybe you can share that. We'll also post this video that we're recording tonight. We'll post that on our YouTube channel so you can check that out too. Um, but let's, let's get into it, man of God. Harold, would you tell us the beginning? Tell us uh, where you were born and coming up and going to school and kind of what set the stage for going into that addiction. First, giving honor to God, my Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I said, Lord, decrease me and increase you. Amen. So that you would get the glory to this story. Um, as you know, I'm a former Dallas Cowboys football player and some other things that I've done in my life. But today I can truly say that God gets the glory for me today. I've had my 15 minutes of fame, but God gets this glory today, and this is what drives me. Hallelujah. Because it's not about me, it's about, it's about God. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to start the story off by saying that I was born and bred right in this area. Actually, I was born across the river in Meadow Brook. And we migrated over here. My grandfather had a pool room down there on Ballas Lane. And I kind of migrated from there. Then my mom moved to, moved to Colonial Avenue. And we, we kind of started from there. And I want to start a little bit about, about the educational piece. Uh, when I was small, I was bullied when I was a child. Because I was, I was a runt, I was small. Matter of fact, my nickname then was Pee Wee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Third Street Elementary School, some of you may remember that school, and, and I was picked on and beat up a lot. So one day I came home crying and I told my granddaddy this guy was beating on me and my granddaddy said, if you come home again I'm crying because somebody jumped on you, he said, I'm gonna beat you myself. So that scared me, so I went back to school and sure enough the kid jumped on me again. So my granddaddy told me, you pick something up but you bite him. So when he jumped on me, I picked up a brick, y'all, and I hit him as hard as I, I threw that brick, and I took off running to Third Street. I didn't stop till I got to Bonner's Way. So that started my story. So we were, my brothers and I, we were bullied so bad, we couldn't even ride the bus to church. So about the fourth grade, integration started to happen. Some of you older ones know about what I'm talking about there. So my brothers and I, we went to Third Street Elementary School. So I was like, wow, I'm getting away from the brothers from getting beat up, not realizing where I was heading. I said, man, I don't have to worry about them bullying me. I'm going to go to a white school. I'm going to learn how to use a computer. Even back in the day when computers first started, I said, I don't have to worry about getting beat up. Well, I didn't get beat up over at that school, y'all, but of course I went through the psychological part of it. Yeah. Yeah. The N-word, the being ostracized, you know, the just being felt, feeling like I was worth nothing. But I lived through that. I lived through that, went to junior high school, went over there, that school caught a fire, then I went to uh, that school down there on Fish Street when the church burned up. Then I got the EBA card. So once I got the EBA card, integration and desegregation was in full blast. So now, when the black people started coming from Morewood, Kearney Park, Westside, into EBA card, by that time, I thought I was white. I, 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 I talked like a white guy. You know, I acted like a white guy, and I was like, oh my God, living in heaven, because at that time, the whites had accepted me as one of their own, so I was cool. But boy, we integration. Oh my God. So when the brothers came back, it was like, thanks to the I'm right back where I started. I started getting picked on again because I talked with diction. I pronounced my words. 
I had vocabulary. I had vernacular. But the brother was like, Joker, we gonna do something to you. So I started getting beat up again. I'm like, oh my God. So now I, I, I'm what I called in as a tweener. I'm between the blacks and the whites. The blacks can't stand me because I think I'm white. The blacks can't stand me because the blacks can't stand me because they said that I'm acting white. The whites can't stand me because I'm black. So now I'm a tweener. I'm in between. But something wonderful happened. I start playing sports. And sports is the unifier, y'all. I started playing sports, and as I started to play sports, I had what they call an inferiority complex. I thought I was ugly, I thought nobody liked me, I thought nobody loved me, and then going through what I was going through with the races, I really felt ostracized. Now, I was raised in a loving family. My mama and my dad and my granddad and my great grandma, we were a crew and they loved us so I had love, but I wanted to be accepted by the hood. Now how crazy can Hello, that be? Sir. Listen, I wanted to live in the projects. You know, I wanted to get down and dirty, but that wasn't me. So, EBA Cox, I started playing sports. And as I started to play sports, I found out that it was the unified. So I started to get good. My name started to get out there. So now, let me Paul put a pause in it. The story I'm telling you now is going to lead up to the second part of addiction. Because in addiction, everything has a flashpoint. Everything has a beginning. It has a starting point. It, it, there's a reason that you become addicted to drugs. So anyway, I started to play sports and I got good. So a wonderful, miraculous thing happened to me. The black started liking me, hmm. and the white started liking me. I was in heaven for a change. Hmm. Oh my God! It was all about her. Now I'm, the story I'm telling you now is to go too small. I want too small to have this Carol Red. So I, I I I got to be liked by everybody, and I loved it. But another thing happened was it was the beginning of me being spoiled. Because once I started playing sports, I was good at wrestling, I was good at football. People started to give me things. People started to give me things. And that was the beginning of me being sport. I went over to high school. Um, I played two years of JV ball. I played one year of varsity ball. And one year, this is how my life goes. And one year I played varsity ball, I became uh, a high school All-American. I was in the top 100 players in the, in the United States. That's a big place, y'all. In the United States, I was in the top 100 players in the United States. I don't have that book anymore. I can show because I like the document, I like the research. So I wanted to go to Elizabeth City State University. I went, I loved the campus. I was gonna go there on a wrestling scholarship. I said, coach, can I play football also the coach? I'm gonna show y'all now this story, how God directs your life. How God does things to you that you don't even know and understand. He puts you in a direction that you can't see right now. That wrestling coach told me no. He said, nah, you can't play no football. I came back home dejected. And I liked the little city state. I wanted to play ball. I wanted to go there. Loved the campus and everything. Plus they were getting high, so I loved that too. That was even better. <laughs> so I came back home and Coach Pat Dye himself came to me and said, look, we can't give you a scholarship, but if you walk on to East Carolina and show me what you can do your freshman year, he said, if you show us you can play, I will give you a scholarship. Hmm. Wow, I went over there, my freshman year, I was the hit. But I'm still running into bigotry. I'm still running into that. I remember I walked on the football field, I had white shoes on. And at that time, East Carolina was still the good old boys. So this white guy came up to me, one of the greatest linebackers that played there. He said, hey, buddy, you don't wear white shoes over here, so I had to take my white shoes off. Hmm. Okay? I was hurt, but I kept playing. So I would drive there on the practice team. I was knocking them down, knocking them around. Sometimes they had to stop practice because I was so wild. That's when I started really be wild, y'all. I started coming to my home. I really started to be wild. So my sophomore year, I started. The very first game I played against North Carolina State University, I had over 20 tackles. I was on the map. 
from that point to the end of my career at East Carolina, I had over 493 chapels at East Carolina University. A lot of people don't know this, but I was 185 pounds. I thought I was King Kong. I thought that I was 6'5", 300 pounds, because I was knocking them down. But I had a problem, y'all. I had a problem mentally. My coach used to teach us, her, you too small. He said, you can't, you can't play like everybody else. When you hit people, you got to want to hurt them. You got to want to kill them. So that's what I did. So I had that in my mindset. And when I would hit people, y'all, when I would hit people and hurt them, it would be joy. It would be like having sex. That's how my mind and my heart was so black that I could hurt somebody and enjoy it and love them, said, love them. That spilled over into my social life. I didn't have the ability to separate my social life from my football life. So then I started fighting a lot, getting in a lot of trouble. And then on the street, I would fight people. And I had a technique that I would use that I learned to use. When I would fight people, I would fight them wrestle them to the ground and take my thumb or my fingers and stick them in their eyes all the way up to the knuckle. Thank God I didn't kill nobody. But you better believe, I don't care how big they were, it shut them down. So that's what I did. But my heart, y'all, was black. My heart was dark. It was so black and dark that I didn't, I enjoyed hurting people. When did the drugs start, Carol? Could that been in high school or was that in college? The how drugs. Did that, how did that come in? The drugs started in high school. I started drinking beer about 14 years old. Thank you, Sammy. I started drinking beer about 14 years old. Uh, then by the time I got to high school, I started smoking weed. By the time I got to college, I started drinking wine like Richard, wild, uh, wild Irish Rose. Um, uh, all the wines, I mean, Owens Driver. So I would get drunk, y'all. I would get drunk in this school. So that's when the drugs kind of started to take over for me. Once I got to East Carolina, I graduated a little bit from weed, started doing cocaine. Um, uh, at East Carolina, I started doing more drugs. I was doing painkillers. I was doing acid. I was doing speed. God is good, y'all. I was doing all those drugs, and if I had a died out there playing on that field where they did the autopsy, they say, man, this man is full of drugs. I'd be out there on the football field making tackles, knocking people down. I'd go to the hall, I'd be like, Bleh! Bleh! they so hard, just excited. You know, they don't know I was a that's how the drugs had taken the faith over my life. So I was doing all of those drugs, got drafted by the Cowboys. Then the rest is kind of sort of this. I'll tell you a little story about the Cowboys, then I guess we go to part two. I got down there to the Cowboys and I started hanging out with a guy called Hollywood Henderson, famous football player. Started doing cocaine with him. I thought it was all about me. And the interesting story, I still have a lot of mouth. Let me tell y'all though. When I left Greenville from kindergarten to college, I did everything in Greenville, y'all, so I was spoiled. I get in trouble, I go to court, they get me out of it because I was too small. So it spoiled me. So y'all would think I'm crazy when I say this. When I left here to go to Dallas, Texas, with the Dallas Cowboys, I thought Dallas would like green. <laughs> I was thinking Dallas is going to be, oh my God, was that terribly mistaken. I said, so I went to Dallas with the same mindset of him, doing what I wanted to do, doing how I wanted to do it, talking loud, saying a whole lot, trying to hurt people. So Hollywood put me to the side with him. He said, hey, buddy. He said, we already got one of our on this team, and that's me. He said, do you think they're going to have two black people 
with that much mouth on this team in Dallas, Texas. So the rest is history. <laughs> so I had, a, I did a couple of things I didn't have no business doing, so I got released, I went to Canada. So then I guess now I'm gonna say that I'll turn it back over to you. But the drugs had not started to consume my life then. I was a functional addict, and I didn't know it. I was an addict and didn't know what road that I was going down at that time. That's, that's amazing that you were you were doing those drugs and still able to play your sports. There's a lot of people that are functional addicts, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah. It's like you don't even know what's going on behind the scenes. And that might be people uh, in your family or at your workplaces or things like that. Addiction is deeper than surface level. It's not just the person you would paint as the addict. It can be between many men and women, right? And there was a deeper issue in Harold, wasn't there? Listen to me, there's always a deeper issue behind addiction, right? There's almost always this deeper issue behind addiction. What is that issue? It's a heart issue. Harold said, I didn't care about people, right? Harold has had a sick heart, he had a black heart. He said, there's a sin problem that's even deeper on, than our sir. addiction. On, there's a spiritual problem that is behind most addictions that is connected, that's integrated with that thing. And Harold needed freedom. And so he was at the Cowboys for a year, but his attitude and his behavior caused him to remove him from the team, and he went up to Canada. But a lot of things, but things didn't change at that point, huh, Harold? Please continue, bro. I went to Canada, played up there, still, my attitude didn't change. I went to Toronto, I played in Toronto for a couple years. I got cut, came home. Play some semi-pro ball in Charlotte, which I really loved. I loved QC. I went back to Canada, played a little while with the Montreal Alouettes, played up there for about a year. But all the time now, I'm using drugs. I'm smoking weed, and I've gone a little bit more on smoking angel dust. I smoked angel dust while I was there in, in D.C., so uh, uh, my addiction is growing. In addition, there's a tolerance. And I want to stick a pin in that. I want to go back to something. I want to go back to something that uh, uh, Samuel said. The reason for me using drugs was because I wanted to be accepted. Come on now. And I yeah. didn't feel accepted. But when I used drugs in the drug culture, I could be me. Mm -hmm. I was accepted. And people don't tell you the downside. Just like beer, for example. When you see the beer commercial, it looks so good. That beer looks good. The, the sweat running down the side. And it just looks like it just quenches your thirst. But they don't tell you about how alcohol destroys the body. Alcohol destroys your body more than all the drugs combined. But it's legal. Mm -hmm. So it's a legal way of indirectly killing yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with the drug thing with me. And I was killing myself and didn't know it. So I left Canada, came back, played semi-pro ball. Then I got a chance to play in the USFL with the Washington Federals and the uh, Orlando Renegades. So now, after I finished playing with the Renegades, football is over. Have any of you ever come to a point in your life where you just feel like, what, what good is it to keep living? Mm -hmm. And that's where I was with football. I said, I sat in my bathroom and said, it's over, Harold. There's going to be no more football. There's going to be no more glitz. No more glamour. No more all about you. Nobody giving you stuff. Addiction started to go so What I started doing then was hustling. Right, on the small tip. You know what I'm saying, Shaq? Buying ounces and selling three quarters so I could smoke me a quarter. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Just to get hot hustle. That's what I started. Started there, addiction kept growing. Then I got to the point where I met a guy. I was trying to sell him a pound of weed. He laughed at me and said, man, look, I got something better. I got a thousand pounds of weed. Do you want to work for me? From that moment on, on a two-year run, I know I went through at least half a million, three-quarters of a million dollars. And just weed. No cocaine, 
No, no hair on, no, just straight weed. I was the man. Oh my God, I was the man, and I acted like I was the man. Y'all help me out here. Let me show you how much I thought it was all about me. I had a truck. I bought a truck brand new. I was, I was pimping out trucks and cars back in the 80s. The joker didn't even know nothing about it. I took that truck, I put a jacket tape, I put a rag top on it, I put sunroof in it, I put big tires on it, I put a phone in it. I had an alarm back in the 80s that when you got too close to that truck, it was a step back. It would talk to you. But watch this, y'all. Now, this is the kicker. And y'all help me out. I had a tie cover on the back of my truck. And on the back of that truck, you know what I had on it? On the man. <laughs> Somebody missed that. Y'all catch it a little bit later. I had on the back of that truck, I'm the man. Now, what am I saying? I might as well went downtown with the yeah, police station. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right in front of police. Matter of fact, I should have put on that truck in big letters, I'm selling drugs. That's what I should have done. I might as well have done that. Listen. I'm the man. So whenever y'all hear somebody say, I'm the man, think about Harold and his foolishness and his folly. Because that's where I was at. When did it go downhill, Harold? When did the change begin? When did this, this, begin. Life of, this life of glitz and glamour and being the man, when did it all start to crash? Because there's people that are in that place, right? In their addiction, everything seems like it's going good, everything's hot, right? But, but it doesn't last, does it? Sin is pleasurable for a while, but in the end it leads to death. Okay, so what happened, Harold? My first drug bust, my first real drug bust, me and a buddy was trying to buy three kilos of cocaine. Right out there to stand there and square. It was a reverse thing is what they call. We had $50,000. We didn't have no cocaine, but we were trying to buy three keys. So in the midst of all of that, uh, my buddy was going to buy two, but the guy said, well, I got one more, so they let us go back and get more money and come back. Right out there to stand there and square. So the undercover officer came to the car. He said, well, have you got the money? My partner said, yeah. So the undercover backed up, and y'all, I swear, it was like police started paratrooping me in. I saw a stop sign turn into a police thing. I saw cars turn. I mean, I saw the black coats, the black coats with the yellow letters on the back, SBI. Get out the car. Put your hands up. So my buddy, crazy, Bobby Williams, that's my boy, that's my partner. I'm going to tell you something about Bob over there. When we got busted, I was looking at 80 years in prison. He was looking at 125 years. He set me free. He told the police I didn't have nothing to do with that drug deal. Now, he's got a friend, y'all. He's got a friend. We know jokers that get busted for a bill, and they cut on everybody in the neighborhood. Say, man, you gonna get out in the morning, you ain't got to tell on everybody. Bobby Williams set me free. But, well, not that kind of free. He set me free from the drug. I'm going to get to that free. But that's another free. So anyway, I went on, got on probation, wouldn't do right, ended up going to prison anyway, came home, did good for a little while, started getting high again. And that last run for part three, when I got out of prison, I told myself, I got one more run. Has anybody out here ever told yourself, I got one more Just one more run. Just one more. Just, and I said, I got one more run in the shack. Like to kill me. Like to took me out. So I, I went to a program called the Potter's Wheel. You know. I went to a program called the Potter's Wheel, and it's a regeneration program. Not a rehabilitation program, it's a regeneration program. Mr. Price said it's again? a regeneration program. Not rehabilitation. Does anybody know the difference between the two? 
Rehabilitation is, he just brings you back to who you were. Mm -hmm. And when you come back to who you were, you take yourself right back to where you was at. Yeah. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. Regeneration is, you're born again new. You're yeah. still the same person, but you're a new person. You're yeah. no longer that other joker that yeah. took you to penitentiary, that caused you to use drugs, that caused you to do all manners of things that were wrong, but you're a new person. Mm -hmm. Hence, rehabilitation, regeneration. I tell people all the time, I am recovered. I am not. Now, I am a suffering Bruce Townsend. Let me show you how God works. I was a crackhead and a dope fiend. God spent my life around, allowed me to go back to school, get my bachelor's at 50 some years old. Turn around and get my master's at 60 some years old. The state of North Carolina, I am a licensed school admission. So see, when God do it for you, he fixes it. So that's why I tell people all the time when they try to say, well, I've been in prison, I got to do it. No, you don't. If you just subscribe to God, he'll fix it. If you don't believe it, just ask me. So I did, I went back to school, got myself changed, but this is my story on my deliverance. I was sitting at the Potter's Wheel one day, and some of y'all can relate to this. Y'all did get high or have that high. You know, you know that taste that you used to have? Yes. I don't care how much you did smoke or drink, that taste, you couldn't get rid of that taste. No. I don't care if you get six, seven months clean, that taste, that taste always come yes. back. And if you ain't careful, that taste would take you back to where you was at. I was sitting on the side of my bed one morning, getting ready to go do my chores. And God came to me. Now somebody going to say, were you taking your meds that day, Harold? Were you hearing voices? Ah, let me tell you something. That's all right. That's your story. I'm going to let you tell it. When God, when you see the move of God yourself, can't go by describe to you. Come on now. I can't describe it to you. You can't describe it to me. Come on, son. When you see God move yourself, can't go by describe. Now, if you ain't seen God move yourself, you can't describe. You'll try to. Just just like smoking crack. If you ain't never smoked crack before, you can't tell nobody about smoking crack. You can't do it. I was sitting on the side of my bed, y'all. God came to me and said, Harold. Oh, let me back up. I woke up one morning. I didn't have that taste in my mouth. So in my mind, I said, well, don't worry about it. It's going to be back this evening by the time I get back in. That taste will be back. I ain't, I ain't thinking about it. I went on through the day. Got my chores done. Got back in my dorm that night. And I sat on the side of the bed just about in the same spot. And God came to me and said, you are clean. I heard the voice. Somebody out here gonna probably think I'm crazy. But that's okay. That's all right. Yeah. God said, I've cleaned you up like you've never been cleaned before. God said, You are set free. Now, this God talking to me now in a quiet voice. I said, God said, But I am tired of messing with you. God said, I have protected you from danger, seen and unseen. Talk about it. God, God said, you're going to choose today yes. Yes. what you're going to do. Yes. Now, God said to me, you are clean. I have done something to you that's never been done before. But God said, I'm tired of praying with you. God said to me, if you go back and use another drug, mm -hmm. surely... You shall die. You shall die. Oh. This is what God said to me. And the voice went away. That was 18 years ago. Hallelujah. Woo. And I have not had that taste in my mouth since then. That's a real talk. I have not had that taste in my mouth since then. Now, 
if I sit here and tell you that it don't run across my mind sometimes to get high, I would be lying to you. Because it do cross my mind sometimes to smoke me a rock or get me a bag of dope. Or that's what I love. See, weed and all that loud stuff. That, no, I want, I want a rock right now. Yes, or a bag of dope. I smoke rocks and did heroin every day. Mm -hmm. Every single day I had me some rocks, then a hood, and a bag of dope every day. But when that stuff went across my mind, one word pops up in my mind. Surely. Sure. Sure. I don't even go into the rest of the story. Surely. Sure. This is how scared I am that what God would do. But God done told me that he's not playing with me and that I'm going to die. Surely I should die. If I want to smoke here a rock, and I put the stem up to my mouth, get my jaw, and put my rock in it, yeah. fire the lighter up, I think I will fall dead before I can <laughs> it. That's how scared I will be. Because I know God is he's not a liar. Getting high is not an option today. I thank God for deliverance. I thank God for doing for me what he's done for me, what he's doing for me now. And it's a blessing. That's why anytime I get a chance to tell my story, I have to tell it. I have to tell it. There's an old Negro spiritual that goes, what is this? What is this? To whatever it is. Just won't let me. Oh my peace. Oh my peace. So I have to tell it. Because see now, God is giving this glory today, not me. Not me. God is giving this glory. And it does my heart joy that I can come out and tell this story to y'all so that God gets the glory. That's my joy today. If you don't believe that God can do it, just look at me. Now, there are times I'm a shower. I'm a crazy. Uh, and there are times, mother, that people come up to me and say, he don't take all of this. Come on now. They will say that. It ain't a, what they said. Yes, they but it ain't enough because they don't know what to shower for. Yes, they they don't know what to shout for. If they only knew what you were shouting for, they will get out there and shout you. And shout you. Everybody has a story. The Bible declares no gift is greater than the other. My gift is not greater than yours, and yours not greater than mine, because it all comes together for the glory of God. My gift is to tell my story to you so that you can see that there is a way out. Come on, sir. The amazing thing about this testimony, one of the amazing things is that I didn't even ask God for deliverance. Ah. Ah. I never said, God, help me quit smoking drugs or doing drugs. Help me quit getting high. I think this is the amazing thing about this testimony, y'all. It just, see, I know I'm God. Mm -hmm. Everybody need to get a point in your life where you say, sure. 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 If y'all don't remember nothing else that I've said, and they remember that one word, sure. sure. I thank God for this opportunity. I thank God for this chance to share with y'all the good news. It makes me feel good when I'm out in the community and people ask me, are you a preacher? <laughs> are you a minister? I say, well, no, I'm not, but I spread the good news. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. If somebody walks up to me and says, man, you look like small back in the day, yeah. I'm scared. 
Yeah. I am frightened yes. to death. Yes. I know, I know I need to take a look at myself mm -hmm. because something has gone wrong. Yes, yes. I don't want nobody. Yes. Come on, sir. No grief, sir. Yes, sir. Do y'all know today a couple of things right quick? Number one. Back in the day, I was known as Crackhead Harold and Dope Harold. Mm -hmm. Today, people call me Mr. Randall. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, oh, Are y'all kidding me? Just a few years ago, I was Crackhead Harold and Dope Harold. My son ran up to me one day. He said, hey, Dad. He said, uh, he said, hey, Dad, my friend told us that they saw my crackhead daddy go to his dad up on the phone. But they then one of them said, hey, man, I saw your, your father down there. He's a minister. Uh, he's, he's, he's got his master's. He's a, a, a substance abuse counselor. My son, he never come to me and told me that they said that, but that's okay, though. That's okay. I'm going to reach you for the one for the house call. Come on, sir. Hallelujah. It does me joy to be able to help people. This is what I do. Amen. This is what I do, y'all. And I love it. Yeah. Even though sometimes it don't go the way we make it should go. But it's okay. Because we still have to help people. I said, Lord, I just thank you today. Thank you for this opportunity to share with my brothers and sisters the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. 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 Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I'm not a preacher, but if I were, my topic today would be shoot. Just one word. Shoot. Did they ever say, what are you talking about? Sure. I said, well, let me, I'm glad you asked that. Yes, sir. Thank you. God has set free and delivered me. I mean, I have looked back in our profession as counselors. It's one thing. I had someone to ask me the other day, is it bad to relapse? Mm. No, it's not. Relapse is the final recovery. Because once you relapse, they should tell you something. They tell you that the plan ain't right. Mm. But I tell my clients all the time, in 18 years, I have not relapsed one yeah. time. Come on, sir. Not one. Listen, you, you, you got to be for real about this. Yes, yes, yes. Do y'all know yes. if I go in a restaurant and, and, and Captain B.J., if I go in a restaurant and they say that meat is cooking any kind of alcohol, I will not eat it. Wow. Matter of fact, if he said Bill better, I said, hold up, man. It's Bill on my friend's side. And they look at me like I'm crazy. I said, yeah, I know you're looking at me like, but it's okay. I still need to know. If it, I have to be serious about this thing. I don't ever want to get high again. Yeah. Oh, nothing. 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 Yeah. Amen. 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 My life is better now. My life is better now than it's ever been. On my car, on my tag, I got sure. Mm -hmm. My latter day, my father, ooh, good God, my freaking latter day, far greater than my one. Every Christian needs a theme song. Have y'all ever seen that movie, you know, I'm gonna get you something. When the guy walking, every time somebody walks down the street, the guy says, everybody needs a theme song. Yes. Every Christian needs a theme song. My theme song is, yes, I'm free, praise the Lord, I'm free, no longer bound, no more chains holding me, and my soul is resting, it's just a blessing, praise
I ask right now in the sweet name of Jesus that God continues to heap coals of blessings upon your head. Before I started, I said, Lord, let me increase and let you increase. Because I was sitting there saying, what am I going to say? I said, but Lord, you take me. And he took me right on down. So I, just, so I know that God is good. He's a good God. And he's good all the time. For those of you who know the prayer strip, continue to pray mine and I'm going to do the same for you. And again, thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Apostle Lee, for this opportunity. Thank you, Shaq, for this opportunity. I didn't mean to take up your time, but I got rolling. Boy, it was just good. To see, y'all don't know. Y'all were my therapy today. Because I got some stuff out today. So y'all put it on my tab for some therapy today. Because okay? I had to get that out. I had to get it out. The old Negro Spirit said, I feel better. So much better. Since I what? Scripture with you is from Galatians 5.1. I think this summarizes your old story well. If we put the instrumental on, or if you'd like to pray, Shaq, that would play, that'd be great too. It says this, Galatians 5.1. It says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. Keep standing firm. Come on, sir. And do not subject again to the yoke of slavery. Harold said something very important tonight. He said, there's a lot of rehabilitation places, but there's only one regeneration place. There's a lot of rehabilitation programs is what we're talking about, okay? There's a lot of people that have been in and out of rehab, right? they got all the therapists and all the counselors, and they keep going back because you need more than a mind change. You need more than a habit change. You need a heart change. You need a heart transformation. You need a spiritual transformation. That was what was going on at the potter's wheel. There was something bigger happening for Harold. He was going to know God, Jesus Christ himself. The Spirit starts speaking to him, right? Maybe you've been in rehab before. Maybe you've had counselors talk to you before, but you haven't had that regeneration. You haven't had that spiritual transformation, that heart change. Tonight is your night. Tonight is your night. It's time for that change. This is what you need to do. You need to say, Jesus Christ, I'm done with myself. I'm done with my attempts. I'm done with my striving. I'm done with all my game playing. I'm done with all the money. I'm done with everything I pursued. It's not working. Have you figured out that your system isn't working yet? Have you figured out how many more years do you got to run in the streets? How many more times do you have to go back to jail or back to prison? How much longer do you have to be broke? Do you have to be lost? Do you have to be angry? Jesus Christ laid down his life. Yes, Jesus Christ shed his blood. He spread his arms wide. He gave his life so you could have a new one. Hallelujah. He gave his life so you could have yours back. He gave his life so you can regenerate a new birth, new creation. And it's available for you. It's available for you. I'm going to have Apostle Lee and I'm going to have Harold come forward. If you want to come forward and you want to receive Jesus Christ, if you want prayer for addiction, if you're ready for your life to change, I want you to come forward. May I have Apostle Shirley come forward, please? Ishan, come forward. And we're going to pray for you. Come on, come on. Let's turn up the instrumental a little bit. Thank you, Chef. You're ready for that change? I'm ready for it, God. I need the regeneration. I need more than rehabilitation. I need a new life. I need a new way. I need a new heart. It says in Ezekiel chapter 36, the Lord will remove your heart of stone. Have you ever felt like you had a heart of stone? Like no matter what anybody said to you, you couldn't listen. Like no matter how many times you tried to change it, wouldn't happen. God wants to give you a new heart. He wants to give you a new heart. He wants to give you a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. So come forward now. So come forward and receive prayer. Come forward and pray. Come and repent for your sins. Say, God, forgive me. God, set me right. God, change me. God, I need you. Break your covenants with the demonic. Break your covenant with sin. Come forward now. Who needs prayer? Come forward. Please come forward. These men of God are going to pray for you. Don't hold back. Maybe you're a Christian, but you need to rededicate yourself. Maybe there's a deeper place you need to be. Maybe you're falling back into old sins. Come forward. You don't have to go back. You don't have to.
to go back. Harold's been clean for 18 years, never relapsed. Some people give him this relapse story. They're like, well, I'll relapse a few times and then I'll get right. You don't have to. You can be fully clean, fully free. We're standing in faith for you right now. Come forward. If you need prayer, come forward. Come forward and let these men of God pray for you. Come forward and let these men of God pray for you. Anthony, if you want prayer, come forward now. Come forward and let these gentlemen pray for you. Come forward. Jesus. Begin to pray in your seats. Begin to intercede. People of God. People of God. Begin to pray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Freedom. I want to be set free. I want to be set free. If you want to be set free, if you're longing for that freedom, come on now. Come on now. This is the last night we're going to be out here. And I don't know when we're going to be able to minister to you again. So come now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you want prayer, you need to come forward now. Come forward now. Come forward now. Don't be afraid. Don't care about what the guys on the block are going to think about you. Don't care about what the people around you are going to think about you. And if you're in the right place with God, listen to me. If you're in the right place with God, God bless you. Thank you for being here. Please intercede right now for those in your life who need salvation and those in your life who need freedom from addiction because you're standing in the gap for them right now. Yeah. Sister, will you come over here and have these gentlemen pray for you? I'm going to ask Sharita to come up and pray for our sister over here, too. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to pray for this man. Pray for 